Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back on. I'm going to get my source sheet up. You can find the source sheet for Parashatra A for this week's um, for this week's uh, Parsha share uh, online. You can find it if you're watching it on YouTube. It's one of the comments on YouTube. If you're listening to it on SoundCloud, it's a comment on the SoundCloud. If you are um, on the website, it's a link on the website. And if you're watching it right now on Zoom, you can, you'll be able to see it in the comments. So you can download the source sheet for Parsha Sra A um, for, this, uh, for this week's Parsha Share, which is sponsored by Susan Grayson in memory of her late husband, William Grayson, Bel Ben Moshe, Zichrona Levrocha, whose yard site is on the 25th of Av. And of course, as we always say, his neshama should have an aliyah, and we should all be zeicher to see techias hamesim. We'll begin right away. We've only got three sources, but the third one is quite long. Um, the source number one is a pasuk. It's a pasuk at the beginning of Perik Yudalad of Dvarim. And the pasuk says, Bonim atem l'ashem elokeichem. I love that one. Don't you love that pasuk? Bonim atem l'ashem elokeichem. You are children of God, your God. It's, isn't it just a positive way to start? A shir, Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. You're the children of God. In fact, it's the title of this week's chil- uh, shir, Children of God. That's what we are. But we're going to talk about it. We're going to understand it. I really want to delve into this concept of being a child of God or children of God, as you're going to see. It's crucial. There's a big difference between being a child and being children in the plural. And I want to talk about that. But let's continue the posuk. What is the context of this idea? Of Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. So the Pasuk says, Loisis Goidudu Loisosimu Karcho Benenechem Lomais. So it comes in anticipation of an instruction that Moshe Rabbeinu gives to the Jewish nation. And that instruction is with regard to mourning rituals, not mourning as in M O R N I N G, M O U R N I N G. How should a Jew mourn? So we're going to talk a little bit about the mourning rituals of the ancient Near East. But just to say that Moshe Rabbeinu instructed the Jewish nation that they shouldn't gash themselves or shave the front of their heads because of the dead. And as we're going to see, that was a prevalent uh, method, a prevalent ritual of mourning in the ancient Near East. We're going to get back to that. But... What's interesting is the juxtaposition between the first part of the Pasuk, which is, as I said, Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, so positive, so wonderful, and this idea that you shouldn't um, do anything drastic as an act of mourning when you are mourning a loved one. What is the connection between the two? What's the connection between Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem? In fact, Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem shouldn't be connected with mourning. It should just be a posuk on its own. Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. By the way, what we're going to see next is very important. Ki Am Kadosh Ato Lashem Elokecha. You are a holy and sacred and sanctified nation to God your God. Uvechol Bachar Hashem Lios Leila Am Segula. And it is you that God, your God, has chosen from among all the peoples to be his treasured nation, from all the nations on earth, you are the treasured nation. That's a fitting ending to Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, right? You're an Amsegula. You're an Amsegula, Mikoil Ha'amim Ashal Paneha Adoma. Unbelievable, right? It's an incredible statement by Moshe Rabbeinu with regard to the status of the Jewish nation. God's chosen people. You're not just a people, you're not just a nation, you're not just a group of people who are given a set of commandments. You are children of God. Bonim atem lashem lekechem. So what is this aberrant addition, interpolation, between the second posuk and the beginning of the first posuk? This inclusion of acts of mourning which are forbidden and prohibited as Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish nation. First, let's examine, just for a moment, these eight, I've, I've actually summarized it, there's much more online if you want to look it up. I haven't included any links, but if you do want to look it up, it's not hard to find. 
I have summarized a bunch of things that I found online as to the ancient rituals associated with mourning by the Canaanites and other Near East, or as we call it today, Middle Eastern nations um, of ancient history. Pre-biblical mankind was divided into innumerable religious sects. These pagan sects had unique means of conveying their dead to the afterlife. The acts of cutting and tattooing both of the corpses in preparation for the afterlife and the bereaved as a mourning practice were widespread. The pagan rituals of cutting and tattooing at funerals was believed to assist in passage to the realm of the dead. Ritual mutilation, that's what it is, ritual mutilation was a statement of man's power over the afterlife. I add parenthetically for us Americans, go figure, right? How is that an act of power over the afterlife? But in any event, it stated, according to these ancient traditions, these ancient pagan sects, that life and death were no longer up to God alone. They were a tacit act of defiance. In fact, like many other pagan rites. This act of cutting flesh as a mourning practice was prevalent in several ancient Near East cultures. An examination of ancient Canaanite mourning rituals reveals one possible source for this practice. In John Hunegaard's and Harold Leibowitz's University of Texas dissertation, they describe a lament for the pagan deity Baal. Baal, of course, is mentioned many times in the Torah. Baal was the most important Canaanite pagan god. And um, this lament for Baal by his father El and sister Anat was demonstrated by El descending from his throne and making cuts to his flesh and face. Similar rituals have also been found in Mesopotamian texts. So we see that in ancient Middle Eastern culture, this concept of cutting your face, your skin, was a method of demonstrating how sad and depressed you were at the death of that person who passed, and as an act of defiance to God. I'm not quite sure what their concept of God was, but in any event, it was extremely important for them. In the same way as a Jew sits shiva, they would cut themselves and tattoo themselves and cause themselves self-harm, self-injury, when they were mourning a very close relative. So that is the background context to the instruction of Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish nation not to do that because bonim atem l'ashem elokeichem. So we're now going to look at Nesivas Sholem. The Nesivas Sholem is going to address this entire issue from every possible angle and perspective. The Nesivas Sholem wants to understand why it is specifically with regard to this prohibition that the concept of bonim atem l'ashem elokeichem is mentioned and moreover the Nesiva Sholem wants to understand what it means to be children of God. Let's look at the Nesiva Sholem. If you have your source sheet in front of you, we're just going to read through it and translate it, and hopefully I'll be able to create the backdrop, the context to it, so that we can understand it and take the messages on board. The Hine says the Nesiva Sholem, Behold, Let's look into the fact that it is specifically with regard to this concept of that you shouldn't cut yourself, that the Torah mentions this idea of that you are all children of God. And God has chosen you. I in Ibn Ezra, if you look at the Ibn Ezra, he says, he explains it as follows. You know, the Ibn Ezra is usually 
uh, commentary, it's a rationalist commentary of the Spanish school, the medieval Spanish school. And generally speaking, the Ibn Ezra comments on matters relating to Hebrew grammar and the, how to understand the juxtaposition of different issues in the Torah. But occasionally he branches out and he speaks about theological issues or what we call in the modern parlance, we call it hashkofa issues. And this is one of those occasions and it's quoted here by the Nasiba Shalom. Says the Ibn Ezra, Ki achar she bonim lashem. Once you know that you are children of God, and he loves you so much more than a father to a son, you, it's not possible to understand the love that God has for the Jew. In which case, make sure that you never cut yourself or act in a dramatic and over-exaggerated fashion at something bad that happens to you. Because everything that happens to you and everything that occurs in your life, however dreadful it may seem, is for your good. Somehow it is for your good. And if you don't understand it, As little children do not understand the acts of their parents. You know that when your child runs into the road and is in danger of being killed because a car may run them over and you run into the road and grab them and you hurt them and you pull them onto the sidewalk and you say to them, Naughty! What have you done? You mustn't run into the road. And they begin crying. They're not quite sure what, what they've done wrong. What did I do? We walk into the road all the time. They don't understand that there's grave danger from cars that could run them over. They've got no concept of it because they're little children. And they cry and they're angry with their parents for having hurt them and offended them or whatever it is that may have happened as a result of the parents stepping in to ensure that their child is safe. Rak yismuchu alov. So too, in a situation where something terrible happens to you, rely on God. Depend on God. Know that God has your best interests at heart. Kain tasu gam atem. So too should you do. You should act as a little child acts towards their parent, or at least one day you'll understand as an adult why your parents behave towards you in that fashion in a situation of grave danger because you'll then understand the grave danger. So too, when bad things happen to you in your life and you don't understand them, behave like a yellowed cotton, a small child, towards their parents. You may be angry, but don't allow that anger to overwhelm you because ultimately God has only your best interests at heart. But Amisas Koroiv says the Nesiva Sholem, on the death of a loved one, Ein lonu les velosim korcha. You mustn't cut yourself or to do yourself any self-injury. And what's interesting is, says the Nesiva Sholem, that is not the case for Gentiles, and particularly idol worshippers. Those who don't understand the concept of God, that reaction is not precluded for them because they are not bonim atem la shemelokechem. They are not the children of God. What does that mean? Let's see if we can understand that. Sha'aleyem yidavu adovim biyomi sosob. Do you know what the day of death means for somebody who is not a God believer? It's the end. Your life only has meaning when you are alive. Your life only has meaning when you are conscious and sentient as a human being. But the moment you are no longer conscious and sentient, you're dead, that life is over. It is done. There's nothing more for you to offer to this world. That indeed is a time for great mourning, if that's what you believe. But for the Jewish nation, there's no concept of death. Death is not an end. Why? Because you are the children of God. 
Vahasfarnu Kosov and the Sephorno adds to this, he writes as follows, It's not appropriate to demonstrate how depressed and sad and unbelievably devastated you may be at the loss of a beloved loved one. Because if there's somebody left behind who is of great stature, who is of worth, who is a worthy person, who has something to offer to the world, and therefore you become children of God, you, as a result of the fact that you have a a sort of eternal presence, you are representation of the eternal presence of God. Death is not an end. There is an eternity in the life that follows the death of someone who you've no, you're no longer in contact with, who's no longer part of this world. But you are part of this world and you perpetuate that person's memory by your existence here. You are like they were, Bonim Atem Lashem Kechem, the children of God. Ein al shum And for that reason it is not appropriate to mourn and to be depressed and to worry and to concern yourself with anybody who's died because the death isn't final. Because the, if there are people left behind who are still alive, who perpetuate that memory, then that death isn't final. If we see life in and of itself as the only value of human existence, then you're absolutely right. And that's, by the way, the way the Ode Kechovim work. You're absolutely right The death is the most depressing thing that can happen. But if, as we do, Jews believe that death isn't an end in and of itself, that life in this world isn't an end in and of itself, then death shouldn't be treated as the most depressing event in a person's life. And that's why the Torah wants to tell us that even at a time of the most depressing nature, the most terrible moment in a person's life, may God have mercy on us because the death of a loved one is really a devastating moment. When somebody who is so close to us passes away and is no longer with us. And a person is so depressed that they cannot see beyond this tragic event in their lives. It's just too overwhelming. Nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu tells us, the Torah tells us, you are prohibited from demonstrating that with an act of self-injury and self-harm. Because you still have not lost that which is closest to you and that which is most precious to you as a human being. Because you remain the children of God. You are the children of God. He who is closest to you will never die. He is eternal. And therefore, it is utterly inappropriate for you to mourn in the ultimate fashion of self-injury and self um, and self-harm. And He, God, is your Father, the closest to you that is possible to get close. Who lives forever and for eternity. And therefore it is not appropriate for you, for you to mourn in the ultimate fashion because you still have this wonderful relationship with God Bonim atem l'ashem aleikechem. Bekein. And similarly, Shetismucha l'ashem is barach v'atamin shekom ma sh'oise hu ach l'toivi. And similarly, you should always make sure to understand that everything that God does to you, He does for your benefit and for your good. Umemeil loisis goidadu v'loisasimu korcha b'ne nechem l'meis. And therefore, you shouldn't cut yourself and you shouldn't cause yourself any kind of self-injury or self-harm because that is not an appropriate way to react to the death of a loved one. Continues the Nesiva Shalom. 
וכאשר יהודי מגיע לבחינה זה של בוא נמעטם להשם אלוקיכם. And now, when, if you have managed to achieve this incredible self-control and this incredible self-awareness of who you are and your place in God's world, that you, you understand this concept of בונים אתם להשם אלוקיכם, of being the children of God, שההרגושה הזוי שהשם יזברך הוא אבי ורחמון חיו בליבוי. You understand the deepest depth of your heart, that God is your father and he loves you, and that he wants the best for you and everything that he does is for your good. הרי אפילו במצובים האיומים ביוסה, then you, even in your most depressing and saddest moments of your life, you know that people do themselves enormous um, damage or uh, will, will go to who knows what lengths to express their grief at these moments of great suffering. Gam Oz, however, even then, if you are someone who really understands this concept of Bonim Atem Lashem Elokechem, you will feel Ki Bonim Atem Lashem Elokechem. I can't do it because I'm a child of God. I'm one of the group who calls themselves Bonim Lashem Elokechem. And at any moment, even the most depressing and saddest and darkest moments of my existence, of my life, God is with me. Because I am one of the children of God. And then he will have a fulfillment of the posik that says, God is your shadow. As the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement said, what did he say? The, the avoider, the avdus, the service of a Jew, so too is the behavior of God towards him from above. How is it that a shadow behaves? A shadow behaves in relation to the way the body, the physical body behaves. If you have a light behind you, the shadow is a reflection of the body that comes in between the light and the shadow. God is a reaction, a reflection, a mirror, as it were, a shadow mirror of a person's behavior in this world. If a person is able to enliven within himself this concept of, I am one of the children of God, that's what they're thinking, then, that's the way God will behave towards him from above. And they will truly merit this status, this relationship, the benefit of this concept of Bonim Atem Lashem Elokechem. You are one of the children of God. And it can be better understood once we look at that which the Holy Zohar the primary book of Jewish Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical work, the Zohar, as the Zohar explains it. The Jewish nation is described and defined by two separate um, definitions. What are they? And the first one is, Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeicha. The passage that we're talking about now in Parsha Sra, you are one of the children of God. Uveni Bechayri Yisrael, another passage which says, you, my, you are my child, my firstborn Israel. Begam Bechina Savodim, but there's another Bechina, there's another characteristic or way of understanding what a Jew is to God, and that is that we are the servants of God. As it says in the Pasuk, Avodai heim, they are my servants. Vechi li bnei Yisrael avodim, and to me are the Jewish nation servants, slaves. That's the word, what the word eved means in ancient and classical Hebrew. So we have this dual um, identity as Jews. On the, on the one hand, we are considered to be the children of God, on the other hand, we are considered to be the servants of God. Now, how do we understand that? Says the Zohar. Umavar, it explains, 
Ki eved hu man ovid pekuda de more. What is an eved? What is a servant, a slave? A person that does the bidding of their master. Shabekayim kol mashe mitzavehu adonai. They will do everything that their master commands them to do. They are simply his um, hands, his, uh, the way that a master can do stuff is if they command a servant or a slave to do it. It's as if they are doing it themselves. Avoles leirish roshu lechapsa begenizoi uberoz in de base. But nevertheless, a servant, a slave, is not able to look in the um, crevices, the recesses, the private um, elements of the house of their master. They're simply the, uh, uh, the ability of the master to do certain things, but it doesn't stray beyond that responsibility or beyond that activity. A slave or a servant is only able to do that which the master bids them to do, but they have no role to play in the private matters and private events and private affairs of their master. Avo ben, however, a son, says the Zohar. Rachim may delay areu ke ben de chopis beginizu bechoroz in de base. A son has this ability, not just to be close to the father, but to really become a part of the father's most private aspects, to know the intimate details of every aspect of their father's life. And even though we are referred to, says the Zohar, as the firstborn of God, Israel, um, nevertheless, we never leave this definition. We never are able to exit this idea of being a servant of God. We have this dual personality. We are children of God and we are servants of God. We are the children of God who know everything about God and who are invited into the private rooms and, and the most private moments of God's existence. And yet at the same time, we are the servants of God who are uh, distant uh, distant from God's um, private moments, we're not able to access those rooms, those aspects of God's existence because we are simply servants who must do His bidding. And the fact is that we are commanded, expected to worship God and to be related to God in both of those identities, in both of those aspects of who we are as Jews. And even someone who is able to access this most intimate relationship that can exist between a human and God, never, uh, namely this concept of being the son of God, a child of God, nevertheless, we must also relate to God by this medium of being Avde Hashem, of being the servants of God. So that's what the Zohar says. And says the Nesiv Sholem. And by this, we can offer the following suggestion to answer this idea of Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. Shalokach Nem Ra'ak Domo Zusha Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, Rak B'Mitzvah Zu. That it is specific to this particular instruction, namely, that you're not allowed to engage in excessive mourning. It's particularly in relation to this that God wants us to know Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. Ki im lekim kol mitzvus bedargas eved. When it comes to doing most of the other mitzvus, all the other mitzvus, it's quite enough for us to be an eved, to be a servant of it pekuda demare, who does the bidding of his master or her master. It's quite okay. We don't need to worry because there's no emotions involved. God tells us to do a particular mitzvah and we do it as an eved to a master. The ovid pekuda de more. The shemakayim is called tariaga mitzvahs ke eved ne'emon amakayim mitzvahs adonov. We can carry out all of the 613 mitzvahs just like a servant carries out the wishes of his master. Harei be'eshi yehudi nimtzah. Uh, However, when 
a Jew finds himself in a situation of grave sadness and concern, a very depressing moment in their life, what then? How are, we going, how are we meant to react in that situation? At that moment, it's not going to be enough for you to be a servant of God. At that moment, the identity that you need to grasp onto and hold onto is the one that identifies you as as one of the children of God. It's horses for courses, as we say in English. Each mitzvah requires a different relationship. There are those mitzvahs that require the relationship of Eved, of, of Eved Hashem, of being a servant of God, and there are those that require the relationship of Bonim Atem Lashem Aleikechem. She'afilu b'matzav ha'garua, because even in the most dreadful situation, Adayin Yesh Esa Avarachman, you should know, you need to know, that you still have a loving and um, and worried and concerned father. Uh, that relationship is so important at that moment that you know that your father cares about you, that you have the warmth of that re- loving relationship with God. Hakorev Aleichem Be'yosa, that is closest to you most of all. Ve'hinei, inyun bonim atem l'ashem l'keichem, yesoid ha yesoidus ve'ikar he karim, says the Nesiva Sholem. You need to understand that this idea of bonim atem l'ashem l'keichem, is something that is so important. It is the fundament of fundaments. It is the most fundamental aspect of who we are as Jews, of our identity as Jews of the chosen people. To really believe, to really have faith that you are children of God in every given situation. As I saw, says the Nesiva Sholem, in the Sefer of Beis Avraham, the story about Reb Modcha, Reb Motila Chernobyl, one of the earliest of the Hasidic masters. At, um, there was a, uh, um, uh, time when there was at his tish, at his holy table, Ish Echo Balavera Godol Veneenach Ma'oid. There was a great sinner sitting there and he began sighing he was quite depressed he sounded depressed and the Ramatla said when he saw this sinner sighing he said any Jew who sighs who's sad and doesn't believe that God will accept his sigh will accept his acknowledgement of the negativity of his situation He's not only a sinner, he also becomes an Epicurean, he becomes a God-denier, a heretic. Every Jew, even in the most sinful moment of their lives, has to believe that they are one of the children of God in any given situation. And just as the Rashba writes, in his responsa. We know that whenever there is a halachic disagreement and the two named disputants in Chazal are Reb Meir and Reb Yehuda, we always pask in the halacha like Reb Yehuda. In this particular instance, in this situation about uh, the concept that we've just discussed, Kayam Alon Meir. We actually pass in the halacha uniquely, not like Rabbi Yehuda, even though his disputant, his interlocutor, is Rabbi Yehuda. We pass in the halacha like Rabbi Meir. Shabain kach or bain kach Korean bonim. Whether you're a sinner, whether you're not a sinner, you are always called one of the children of God. Even if you're not at the highest possible status that you can be, even if they don't do the will of God, harehem gam kein bonim. They are to be considered also as children. They are the children of God, not, no matter what their circumstances. A child is always a child. 
This is one of the fundaments of Torah and one of the fundaments of faith of the Jewish faith. That a Jew must believe that they are one of the children of God. And via this idea, via this understanding, once we get this into the fiber of our being, we can understand that which the great rabbi of Kobrin said. That any Jew who transgresses even the most dreadful sin. And as a result of the terrible sin that they've done, they're not able to pray because they can't get themselves to pray. They can't get into that mode of prayer. Have you ever felt like that? You've done something wrong and then you can't get yourself into kind of a spiritual situation. You can't feel God close to you. Can't cry and empty out his heart before God. He's not, um, he's not even on the way to being on the threshold of Hasidus. And after that, um, he added, he said as follows, is even not on the threshold of Judaism. Somebody who's not able to believe that even in their most dreadful and um, low moment that they have access to God because God is their father is not even at the access point of what it means to be a chosid or even a Jew. Because the threshold of Judaism who bonim atem l'ashem elokeichem that is, you are one of the children of God. And this threshold, this entry point, this portal into what it means to be a Jew is even for somebody who is at the lowest, it's not in a high status. I'm not a great person. I'm not a tzaddik. They need to know, but nevertheless, Somebody who's done every Avera possible, any Avera that's written in the Torah, they have transgressed, nevertheless, they are still. So that they can commune with God and pour their heart out before Him. Because you need to know, and we know it. As a child, you never lose that status of being a child. No father can deny their son or their daughter the status of being their child. And every child of any father, of any parent, knows I am that parent's child. Doesn't matter what happens. Our bond is never broken. Our connection is never severed. And that too applies to any Jew. Even a Jew who has committed the gravest sins is, has always access to God as their father. Why? This is an eternal status. This is not something that ever changes. And this is what Reb Meir was machadesh in the words that he spoke. This is what Reb Meir said, which was so novel and so interesting. You might have thought that this concept of being that only applies to those who uh, perform that which God expects of them. Who, you know, is a perfect child, therefore I'm a son. In other words, I need to achieve it by having done the things I need to do. Reb Meir Chidesh, you know what Reb Meir said? His Chidesh is, you know what Reb Meir is really telling us? It's so beautiful and so special. You should know that being a child of God is something that's eternal. In any kind of situation, in any kind of circumstance. Because God chose you. And you are the chosen people of God, and therefore, notwithstanding anything that may occur in your life or in the lives of the people around you, you remain one of the family. You remain one of those who can be considered. You need to know, says the Nesiva Shalom, whatever you're going to say about being a child of God, 
The concept of being a child of God was written in the plural. Bonim atem l'ashem aleikeichem. V'isa b'svarim akdoshim, and the holy books tell us, sherako rabim hamukushorim ke'echod, it is only the, um, the group, the larger group, the whole group, that is connected to each other as if they are one, nikroim bonim, it's only then that you are called children in the plural. You're not a child on your own. You're only one of the children if there are children connected to each other like one family. He who is singular, who is outside of the klal, outside of the family, you're not going to be called a son. And you need to know that God doesn't act like a father to one who is considered on their own. Only on those who are connected to a greater whole. It is a whole that is connected to each other because there's multiple parts, but in and of themselves those parts don't exist unless they are part of a whole. The, the daughters of Tzolofchad said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Why should our father's name be lost from his family? Why should it be somehow considered in a derogatory fashion? And in this beautiful pshat of the Torah Sa'ovais, quoted here by the Nesiva Sholem, Shahashem Avinu, this concept, the name that is given, the reference. Our Father, Shakodish Baruch Misyaches Ba'al Yisrael, that the uh, that God Almighty gives and somehow identifies the Jewish people with. It's Rak Mimishpachto, it's only if you are part of the family. This concept of Avinu only applies if you are mimishpachtoi from his family. It is only when the Jewish people are united with one heart, like one man, like one family. And therefore, as it were, God says, At that moment, God says, Why should the name of the Father be removed from uh, um, the from the status, from the concept of the family. In other words, the family is worthy of me acting towards them as a father because they are a family. If there is lacking this concept of family among them, then God will remove, as it were. Then we understand this idea that God will have removed his a connection towards them by this reference towards them as Avinu, as our Father. Uh, as we say in Shemun Esra in the Bracha of Sim Sholem, you should bless us, our Father, Kulanu Ke'echad, like one, Bo'er Ponecha, with the light of your face. That this identity of God as our Father only applies if we are united as one, if we are together like one big, beautiful family. Says the Nesiva Sholem, and the explanation for this is like it says in the Holy Books. In the Holy Book, the Noyam Ali Melech. That God gave advice, as it were, to the nation of God. How to arrive at the purest possible way of worshipping God. That we should connect as much as possible together with other Jews in one united way. You should know that there is a world that is called Kol Yisrael, all the Jews. And in that world, there is neither sin nor wrongdoing. It is only individuals who sin and do wrong. When Jews are connected to each other like one large group, they are constantly standing, as it were. They um, are, um, emulate this concept of holiness and sacredness. And when a 
Jew connects himself and belittles the the individuality within himself to become one of the nation as a whole, to become one of the Jews, not just to be an individual Jew. He wants to be one of the Jews that are connected like one. He will have reached this status of being a Kol Yisrael, one of the group that can be considered all of Israel. And this is what the Torah is advising us. You are the children of God in the plural. Bonim shetit shetis. You should connect yourself and be connected towards each other and be one of a group that be cons- can be considered Kol Yisrael, all of Israel. Be one of many. The, the Oz, Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem. And then you will be treated like children of God, your God. And also hinted at in this posuk of Bonim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, and you shouldn't you, you shouldn't cut yourself. The Kashem Shek Beinyanim Agashmiim Loisis Goidudu. Just in this, as in matters of physicality and material things, you shouldn't be misguided. You shouldn't cut yourself. You shouldn't cause yourself any self harm. When a person dies between your eyes, this is the method by which we know the ancient Canaanites used to. Um, express their mourning, express their suffering at the loss of a loved one. So too in matters of the service of God. There are times when a person cannot succeed in any aspect of their lives, in any thing that they touch. It just doesn't work. His brain is closed and his heart is closed. And his limbs are doing bad things. You're not able to control yourself and you're not able to get your brain on board. You're not able to get your heart on board to believe, to have that emotional connection. And you're doing the wrong things. And your entire spiritual world can be considered dead, over, Done with. And even worse than that, there is this idea of being cast out. As we say, and we're about to begin Elul, we say, Don't throw me away, don't cast me out from before you. you we say to God, It's as if a person thinks to himself, I've been entirely banished from the palace of the king. That's the worst possible thing that can happen to a Jew. A Jew thinking to himself, God has cast me out. I'm not a worthy Jew. I'm not a worthy person. I'm not a worthy human being. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Nothing is working for me, neither in material matters nor in spiritual matters. I'm dead, I'm done with, I'm useless, I'm an outcast. And it is in reaction to this that the Torah says, Bonim Atem. You are the children of God, your God. This is something that outlasts and outsurvives any possible situation. Don't imagine that any bad thing that happens to you or that you do and you now feel bad about yourself, that somehow you have been discarded or cast out from God's presence. You are no longer one of His children. When a Jew believes from the deepest depths of his heart, with the fullest possible faith, that they are one of the children of God, they are able to perpetuate this characteristic of their lives. And no aspect of their life, which seems to be a counterforce to this concept of has any power to undermine your status as a Jew among Jews, 
who will be considered as one of the children of God. We'll leave it here for today. Thank you.